Um, so welcome, folks. Uh, this is the Reinventing the High School Transcript panel. And um, before we start, just think for a minute about your own high school transcript and what was on it. And what did that actually mean? Did that say anything about you and what you were prepared to do once you got out of high school? And uh, anything about your success today? So just think for a minute about that. And while you do that, I'm going to introduce, I know you, I'm not supposed to say much about our panelists, but you want to at least say who they are. So uh, we have Stacy Caldwell here from the Mastery Transcript Consortium. Um, we have Mike Flanagan, also from the Mi Mastery Transcript Consortium. We have uh, Christina Gonzalez from Princeton, and we have Andy Caldwell from the Next Generation Learning Challenges. And we have a really wonderful um, conversation um, and dialogue that we want to have with you today about the high school transcript. And the reason we're here today is because and actually, I've been hearing this a lot in, in conversations throughout um, the various panels I've attended around how we are really not adequately preparing our students to be successful in the 21st century global economy, right? And, um, and in both K-12 and higher education, we've been um, dealing with really narrow measures of uh, student success. And on K-12, um, on the K-12 side, that's largely been driven by state and federal accountability systems, by, for instance, No Child Left Behind, which required standardized testing every year in grades three through eight and in high school in English language arts and math. Um, that's been replaced by the um, Every Student Succeeds Act, which still requires standardized testing, although with a bit more flexibility for states. Um, and then of course, students themselves are really driven and motivated by those things that matter to colleges. Advanced placement tests, international baccalaureate tests, SATs, ACTs, and by, and by their grades. And so I think there's a growing consensus that we really need to uh, broaden um, the uh, way K-12 schools are defining student success uh, and how they're going about ensuring students are really developing um, a broad set of competencies beyond just academic content knowledge. And so where we have some leverage is around the high school transcript. And um, you know, the transcript um, is a tool that's supposed to be providing students, families, teachers, schools and colleges with information about students' performance, about their progress, um, but it's really, um, in a lot of ways, serving as a chokehold on um, pedagogy, on student learning, and on um, how students really experience um, their K-12 education. And rather than serving as a marker of meaningful student learning, it's really just crediting student achievement um, according to Carnegie units um, of seat time, right? Um, and not really tapping into students' intrinsic motivation or measuring things that really matter, like students' character and caring and ability to lead and collaborate and analyze and all of those, those things that we know are really important for them to be successful. And so high schools and colleges are really thinking about how to reinvent the high school transcript. And um, our panel is going to be talking about uh, new ways to define and measure student success that go beyond um, a focus on rote learning, that go beyond um, students' ability to regurgitate academic content, and really to those important skills leadership and persistence and the ability to um, work in teams. And um, we'll also be discussing this emerging national effort that Stacy and Mike are involved with called the Mastery Transcript Consortium, um, which is a group of high schools that are hoping to replace the high school transcript or at least supplement it with um, a 21st century alternative uh, to richer, deeper definitions of student success and the kinds of skills um, that we know are crucial for them to be successful. And so if, they, if MTC is successful, it really has the potential to really change the way we design high school and as well as how the college admissions process works. So that's a little bit of background of wh why we're all here together. Um, and I'm gonna start with Andy um, cause to sort of set the stage for us. And um, through the My Ways Project at Next Generation Learning Challenges, uh, you've been working to distill and synthesize the major success um, definition frameworks. I'm just curious, like, what's the urgent need for fundamentally changing how we define and measure student success? Well, the people in this room don't really need me to enumerate all the all of the reasons why. Everybody in here gets it. I mean, if, if you didn't when you arrived in San Diego, you probably do now because it's <laughs> that's what we've been hearing about for the last two days. The interesting and compelling challenge in front of us is that um, we're sitting at this point where things that we know individually uh, are not reflected in the systems that we're all part of. Um, and that's exactly where this transcript, transcript issue is, because 
I, you know, the number of times we've had educators or parents or policymakers or school board members point to the NGLC My Ways competency framework, which is a distillation of all the 25 major frameworks. It's sort of like the Rosetta Stone for them all. And, they've, and they say, I love that. That's exactly what we want for our kids, but don't make that happen at our high school because it's not the game the colleges are playing. You know, and and so you know they're they're caught in a in a system that still recognizes the goal line and the metrics and the assessment strategies that were in place you know 50 years ago. Um, so it's it's helping the systems reflect what we not just not just we but but most people right now understand to be the kinds of competencies that kids are going to need when they graduate. So Stacey, I want to ask you, you're the new executive director of the Master Transcript Consortium. Um, so, and these are a group of high schools that have been committed to developing and implementing alternative models of assessment and crediting and transcript generation. What's the vision for MTC and, and what's the challenge you're trying to address? Sure, um, so let me start with a quick question. Uh, how many folks in the room are uh, work in high schools right now? Okay, most of the room, great. Uh, so, uh, Renita did a nice job of opening with sort of think about your own transcript. So, before today, how many of you had spent more than maybe a half an hour of brain space thinking about your transcript? Some of you, half of you. Um, so, I think this is, um, I, I asked that question uh, to, to make, a, make the point that, uh, you know, we, oh, I need to turn on my, I'm loud, but it won't be, but it won't be, uh, yes. There we go. Um. Sorry about that. Um, to make the point that, you know, uh, when I heard about the work that the MTC is doing and we all sort of started in uh, to, to look at this, um, this, is, this, is, this is not an effort because we're a bunch of transcript nerds. Uh, this is an effort that said, um, we looked, as, as Andy just mentioned, at all the data that we have, and, and you know, I'll just give a, a little, a couple, uh, a little bit of a amen chorus to this. We know that we've known about personalized learning for you know, many, many years. Benjamin Bloom published his article in 1984 that showed the two standard deviations. This is not news that we need to be doing personalized education. Uh, recent data and some of the writings on the jaggedness principle that Todd Rose and others have done have talked about really meeting students where they are uh, and that there is no one path. So you know, this idea of optimizing the path and having every student go through it, well, turns out my path, Mike's path, Christina's path, Andy's path, they're all different. So we, we know this, we deeply know this, and we know that the sort of education we should be delivering in high schools is the sort that meets students where they are and delivers that, and that is deeply personal and deeply authentic. So if you get a student working on a project in, in the local community on something that is uh, actually generating new information, they're gonna take a lot more out of that than uh, sitting in, a, in any sort of lecture classroom. So we know all of this, and, and we know that we really want to deliver that sort of education, deliver it consistently. And so that makes us all step back and say, okay, what's stopping us from doing that? Uh, and really one of the big things that we feel like is stopping it is when you look at the college admissions process, and specifically some of the tools within that, such as the transcript, that puts a, that puts a nice boulder in the way. So schools that are taking the risk and doing this innovation have to turn around, and I've heard many of them talk about it as essentially lie about what the students have done. So take these really rich experiences and turn it into a grade and a traditional class name. So the MTC is a collection of high schools. We're about 181 right now and growing, uh, built around this idea of, hey, we want to deliver this right education, so let's go right at redesigning and, and moving one of the boulders. Uh, so we like to talk about ourselves in sort of three dimensions. The idea is that concept that I just talked about, the, real, the idea of changing teaching and learning. Uh, the tool that we want to build is a transcript, and I'll, I'll let Mike talk a little bit more about that, but we're, we're trying to, uh, through design and technology, design something that is easy for colleges to interpret and read, but makes the room for high schools to deliver uh, the content that they think is most important. So they can deliver against the competencies that they want to do using, uh, using many of the frameworks that, that uh, Andy and others have talked about, uh, but the colleges can, can read it. 
But then I would say this is a technology play, but it's also frankly a, um, the net, uh, it's a network play. The network is hugely important here. So we are growing the number of high schools that we have in our group, and that will be hugely important to the conversation. So the more that we can have bring to the table a rich and diverse set of high schools, the more when we go have the conversation with colleges, we'll be welcome into that conversation. So the goal and the vision would be we have this network of high schools, we have a network of colleges, we figure out a way to actually have that conversation in a real way, because everybody wants to make this change, but the systems are sort of in the way, and I think if we pull those two networks together, we'll be able to deliver something that actually lets us make that shift to the transcript and enables a lot of the innovation that's already going on. And I'm gonna come back to you uh, with a couple other questions, but I wanna ask Christina, um, you know, it, it's, obvi it's obvious that it's important for this effort to move towards a mastery-based transcript um, to proceed in a way that's informed by what colleges and universities want um, and, and what, their in what their admissions offices want. And so in your role at Princeton, um, you're working with students, especially first-generation um, underrepresented students who are making the transition into Princeton. I'm curious how Princeton's reacted to this idea of a mastery transcript and, and why it's of interest to you personally given the role you play. Yeah, so, um, so I think to start with, um, we are interested in the idea because we know, just like everybody else, that um, a grade on a transcript doesn't reflect the student in their entirety, right? Particularly when it comes to questions of equity and the experience of the particular student, right? So when you think about this from, you know, in terms of the college transcript, so I'm on the success side of, of uh, Princeton, so I don't work in admissions, so I can't speak for the admissions office, but when we look at, you know, the ways that students perform, um, you know, in terms of college success, um, you know, a, a B in first year chemistry for a student who's coming from an under-resourced high school um, and maybe started with a C- minus in that course um, is a very different B than a student who has come from um, Andover or Exeter, um, has already taken first year chemistry essentially um, and has gotten an A in that course, right? The, the kind of experience that that student has been through and the journey that they've been on in order to get that grade is complex um, and we want to recognize uh, the, the, the kind of soft skills and the um, qualities that that particular grade reflects and the B in and of itself does not tell us anything about that student, right? Um, so I think in terms of a holistic understanding of students and it, from an equity perspective, it's really important to think beyond grades. Um, I would say that in terms of um, Princeton's experience with uh, high schools who have experimented with other forms of um, assessment, um, when we look at students' applications, um, we look at what the, the high school provides, right? And we try to read them in context. So um, there are high schools who have already made this switch who submit a lot of pros, right, about the student. Um, and there are colleges that have made this shift. So Hampshire College is one of them. There's other places that don't operate in terms of GPA or grades. So um, this isn't necessarily a kind of um, entirely new space, right? There's, there's precedent for this. Um, and I think it's important to, to consider um, you know, what this means in terms of um, how we're able to understand what our students need when they hit the ground in our institutions, right? So more information for me from an advising perspective is great, right? Because it helps me have a conversation with a student in terms of, um, okay, so if you're entering into, you wanna be pre-med, um, which math classes should you be taking? I have no idea right now if a student gets a B in calculus, what that means about their actual, um, what they've learned in the classroom, right? All I know is that they passed calculus, and even if it's an AP calculus grade, right, I don't actually know what that means in terms of what they've learned other than their test scores, and we know that grades and test scores carry with them all kinds of um, implications in terms of bias, right, both in terms of test design and in terms of um, the, the unconscious and conscious bias that instructors and assessors bring to that grade. So I think it's an interesting space. So um, I wanna come back to you, um, Stacy. So, you know, there's the issue with grades having, you know, there's grade inflation, there's not consistency one from one teacher to another within a school, within a subject area. Um, how do you guard against that in this new system, right? Do you have the same potential drawbacks? Sure, and, um, and Mike, I'll punt to you for a second to, to think about some of how we're doing with this design. Um, so, so yes, there's absolutely always, um, always going to be that, that potential. I think 
the possibilities here are really rich. And so, um, you know, we as an organization are trying to be um, a tool that be could be implemented many different ways, but, but let me just paint a picture of one implementation model just to give you a sense of, of how it could work. Uh, so one of the ways that, that folks are thinking about this is, uh, is a high school could define their sets of competencies and then get deeper than, you know, so within calculus you have the eight to 10 competencies that give you a richer sense for what students are doing. Um, there could be, there are likely some interdisciplinary competencies, some competencies around uh, creativity, communication, those sorts of things. Um, so one model would be um, students understand the set of competencies that they're, uh, that they're going after. They have a mix of courses and projects that they're working on. Uh, and the student, as, as an agent, is responsible for pulling together the, um, essentially the evidence to say, yes, I've met that competency. So as they work through um, problem sets or projects or um, as, they deliver a, um, as they deliver a presentation, the student would say, hmm, I think that I have put together a rich enough set of evidence to submit and say, I think I've met this competency. And a school could have a process for evaluating against that. Um, so maybe there is a team of a couple teachers that, um, that uh, is organized by, um, you know, by different competency area that takes a look at that and va evaluates it against a consistent um, rubric or standard that the school has established. So this is rich and interesting in a few ways because what it does is it gets, um, I, I think the most valuable thing is it takes the teacher um, and moves them out of the constant judge role and puts them in the, uh, the coach, facilitator, guide role. It puts the teacher really in the role of giving the student feedback and helping them get ready to deliver against these competencies. Uh, and it also, from a school perspective, puts the school in charge of granting uh, credits in a consistent way, as opposed to, so you, know, you move from the time and individual teacher grade to competency demonstrated through evidence and a consistent way that you as a school are, are granting credit. So does it solve everything around grade inflation? Certainly no, um, but uh, does it give schools a sort of more structured way to say, hey, this is, we as an institution are standing behind this credit that we deliver and, and here's the system that, uh, that we've developed. Do you wanna speak to any of the technology that? Sure, so um, one of the things that I think it's important to say right now is that when you think about the Mastery Transcript Consortium, um, there is no transcript. Right, right now, uh, you know, effective today, uh, this is a vision that we're creating, uh, and we're partnering with schools to create uh, both a design and also a software implementation model uh, to, to put this in the hands of schools. Um, so if you take the, the um, scenario that Stacy was describing, where we give schools a framework in which they can store their various competencies, which we're calling mastery credits. Uh, this is a digital transcript, so it should have layers. Uh, the top layer is that single summative page that allows um, a reader, whether they're in a college or an employer, to very quickly ingest it and make sense of it and understand the shape, the jagged profile of the kid. Uh, but then underneath, if they want to drill down and learn more about what is underlying some of those different competencies or mastery credits, they're all laid out there and they're visible. And then underneath that is those examples of student evidence that Stacy was talking about. Um, so I would submit to you that the bottom two layers are actually the easier parts of the technology challenge. Um, there are many uh, software companies today that have interesting and strong points of view on portfolios. Uh, the act of storing different rubric frameworks and uh, organizing them and displaying them isn't that hard. Uh, the, the challenge for us is the design, that single page and making it ingestible. And that's because of some constraints that we've set for ourselves. Uh, one thing that we really should be clear here is that when you all closed your eyes and you vi envisioned your own high school transcript, I guarantee you that 99% of them had the same three data elements on it. It had courses, it had grades, it had some index for time, right? They, either the year that you took them, maybe the semester. Uh, and from an architecture perspective, those three building blocks are the building blocks of pretty much every single piece of software that you use in your school today. All of them are centered around courses, we string courses together to make schedules. We add grades to courses to create rosters or grade books. And so all the student information systems today are uh, keeping information that way. The mastery transcript will have none of those. Uh, <laughs> our stretch goal is to replace those with sets of mastery credits, what we're calling mastery credit architecture, that can be tiered and sequenced in such a way that you can clearly establish what the foundational graduation requirements are for a student, but also, as I said, visualize the shape of students who have gone to achieve in particular areas. 
One way of thinking about it is this. If you took, if you're at a high school right now, and you took the transcripts of you know, just 10 of your best students right now and laid them out anonymous, blacked out the student names and maybe the names of their teachers, I, I submit they would look almost completely identical. You would have no you know, ability to differentiate those students. They're all taking very similar courses. Again, I, I'm, I'm specifically choosing the band of top uh, students in your school. Um, our stretch goal would be to have 10 mastery transcripts where you could actually see the difference between someone who's got a real passion for STEM versus someone who is a creative problem solver uh, and versus someone who is uh, a sort of a quiet leader uh, who displays empathy and persistence and who generally makes the uh, people around him or her better. Uh, so from a technology perspective, the challenge we have isn't really data interoperability, it's really data availability. We're actually looking for data that isn't stored today in the systems that you use in their schools. Um, so what that means is that day one, we're gonna have to build a translation package, something that allows people to do the work of converting their existing data to mastery credits. And so the next year that we have in front of us, the prototyping stage, is, partnered with a, is to partner with a small group of schools to do nothing more than generate sample transcripts from real students so that we can then engage folks from higher ed to give us feedback about those visualizations to make sure that they're doing the work they need to do. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, so Andy, I wanna go back to you because all of this that what we're talking about has enormous implications for how we design schools. It, it means we're not sitting in different class, in a physics class and then going to our, you know, our calculus class. And then yeah. it, it really has real implications for yeah. how we design and structure yeah. schools. Yes, so let me just observe, everybody's remaining very calm here, which is nice. <laughs> but I mean, inside, I hope there's some part of you that's just going, God damn it, this is so great. And this is just like, this is, you know, this is what we're talking about here is like taking the boulder that's way upstream that prevents this rushing river of what mm -hmm. kids should be experiencing in high, in high school and, and below from happening, as, as you just heard. Um, you know, how the trickle, trickle down, just to really beat the metaphor to, to death, <laughs> um, effect of, of that expression of the goal line of success has on like everything, policy, practice, schedules, how kids spend their time and so on. So, you know, our, our NGLC um, has for seven years been catalyzing new kinds of schools that are fighting against that <coughs> tide. Some of them are here today a few of them are here in California, and they are driving themselves literally batty trying to do dual systems at once that, that coordinate with the A to G California diploma system and that somehow stay faithful internally to the kind of learning experience that they're creating, which is experiential and builds mastery autonomy and purpose and relevance and meaning and is also rigorous and has all the elements of like deep practice that we've been hearing about here and all of that stuff. And it's often case interdisciplinary as well. Right? Yes, yeah, you know, all, all, all of that. And, and right now, you know, it's only the sort of outlier saints and heroes who make that happen on a genuinely deep school-wide basis. And so this is all about turning a system that is a log jam into a system that is an enabler of, of all this. If you want to see what these schools look like um, and how, how they are working with their communities, even despite systems like this, um, go to nextgenlearning.org. Um, when you're there, you'll see a reference to uh, um, this My Ways project. That is, the, it's, the, it's the product of three years of research into what they have done, why they have done it, and what they have learned you know, about how, how impossible this is to do unless you enlist your, your whole community in understanding the why um, this is so urgent and why it leads to this level of profound change in school and learning design and the what of the, the, the new North Star of student achievement. You know, if, you don't, if you don't hold on to those and make them visible and strongly and collectively held in your school, then, then all the work is at risk and it becomes incremental and temporary. So go there, nextgenlearning.org. Thank you. <laughs> Just plug in this organization. Yeah. Um, so 
So that's a really good question, right? We got to bring communities and parents and families along. And I'm curious how MTC, how you're doing that, because you know, as a parent in this audience, you might be wondering, well, okay, if we move to this mastery transcript, will colleges adopt and accept this new model? You know, are are, are you messing with kids' ticket to college if you totally change this without bringing parents along and bringing colleges along? So how are you working with these different constituent groups? Sure. Um, so, you know, first I guess I'd say let's recognize that this is a, not a monolithic conversation, right? So, um, a independent schools who have students who are sort of, um, you know, sort of deep into the very competitive admission space. Uh, parents have a set of concerns. Uh, uh, um, parents who are trying to navigate this for the first time with their students have a set of parent concerns, and those are not necessarily the same concerns, but they all are, you know, parents wondering if this change is good for their students or not. Um, this, is, this is one of those um, areas that we, frankly, as an organization have said, look, um, a, we are a membership organization of schools, and really the schools own this conversation with the parents. Um, and uh, what we've been hearing from folks is, but we'd like some help. So, um, so it is part of what we're about to dig into and actually really try to make sure that we are, um, that we're working, that we're working with the schools, giving them tools, um, you know, helping them connect to one another to make sure that we actually help them, help them deliver the message. Uh, but, um, you know, many of our schools uh, right now are sort of in early stages of the change. And so they are, they see this as a goal. They see that they want to get there. And then um, uh, some of them are, um, you know, sort of, have a long history of delivering education in a very certain way, and so this feels like a, a very big shift to their community, and they have, you know, alumni organizations that are sort of looking at them a little askance and saying, what are, what are you doing? Uh, so they've started to approach this in a number of different ways, and I think the, these are some good, interesting, creative ways that they've approached, approached it. Some are saying, great, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna start in middle school. The stakes are different in middle school. We can have an honest conversation with parents about why this is a better educational model. And if we get them through middle school, by the time you get into high school, those kids and those parents are saying, I like this feedback model. I like this way of working interdisciplinary and on projects. I don't want that to change. So that's some of, some of what they're doing. Others are taking, um, advisory periods and starting there, or the intercession. So if they have a first semester and second semester in like a January term that's sort of a, a project role, they'll take that as the first opportunity to really dive into this model. So they're looking for ways to bring their whole community along, certainly the parents, but also you know, the faculty and, and their boards along, but using some of those avenues in to really try to, um, try to take that on. I think our role can be in supporting that, um, giving them some tools for how to have the conversation, uh, and then and then honestly, some of, the, you know, some of the biggest questions they have are, what will be the impact? Will my student not be able to get into this college? And I think that's the broader network role that we talked about earlier. We need to, we need to partner with the higher ed organizations. We need to, um, and you know, both admissions and, and folks who are doing work like what Christina is doing, to really start having some of those higher ed advocates. Because I think as we bring those folks to the table, that conversation with parents gets a lot easier. Well, I think, I mean, one of the things that I think we're missing a little bit in this conversation is the fact that the transcript is only one aspect of the college application, yes. right? Yeah. So um, we, when we look at a student, we look at the transcript, we look at letters of recommendation, we look at the college admissions essay, we look at the student in, in their whole context, what we have available to them. Um, so one of the, the questions that I have about this project and about um, transcripting and admissions more broadly is the ways that um, we may be continuing a, a kind of um, inequitable system, right? So um, what we know about letters of recommendation, and I'm sure those of you who write 50, 100 of these a year can also <laughs> test this as I do, um, it, there's differences in the letters of recommendation, right? And so when I read for organizations like, uh, I read for Jack Kent Cook Foundation, um, I read uh, you know, for, for other nonprofit um, scholarship organizations, you can see the discrepancy, right, between um, schools and, and faculty and teachers who have the resources to be able to spend the time to write those letters of recommendation, who have had the opportunity to get to know the student in their whole context, and that is the beauty of independent schools, right? You have faculty who are able to be teacher, coach, mentor, 
a holistic approach to student, knows family, knows all of that. Um, and then you have other contexts, other schools where um, teachers don't have the time, the, um, the, the capacity to be able to get to know each and every student um, and don't necessarily know the rules of the college admissions game, right, in the same way. Um, and so we see a huge disparity, right? I'm not talking about Princeton admissions, but I think overall we see a huge disparity in what those letters tell us. And we also see a huge disparity in the college admissions essay, right? You have students who are being trained from the time that they're six years old to write the college admissions essay, right? Versus students who are coming from contexts where they are just writing it by themselves and they may write a paragraph about, you know, what happened in their um, high school basketball game that showed resilience and that's what they put on the page, right? And so there's a huge difference. Um, and so I think when we're thinking about, you know, alternative transcripts, we also really have to think about, like, our commitment of resources, both in public education, um, so that, w and, and to teachers, right, to give them the professional development opportunities, to give them the resources, to give them the additional manpower, women power, people power on the ground to be able to do this work, right? And so it has to come with an investment of resources. It can't just be about changing the form. It has to be about radically changing how we believe that education should function in our country. So I would just want to build on that point with a real example. So I am the parent of a high school student. I have a 10th grader. And uh, he has a very jagged profile. And he is obsessed with anything that is mechanical or that is electronic. Uh, and he spends all of his free time building and flying and racing drones and building robots. Um, foreign language, not so much. Uh, you know, uh, it's just some, not an area in which we've convinced him he really should be interested. Um, but you know what? He is going to be okay in the college admissions process. He is graduating, by the way, with a very traditional transcript. It's going to be A's and B's. Uh, we, we're, he, uh, we're too late to help him out in terms of his transcript. Uh, but he goes to a school where, by virtue of really good resources and college counselors, they're going to help him build the apparatus that surrounds that transcript um, so that he can effectively portray that jagged profile that we find really interesting and that hopefully some school will find compelling as well. Um, the problem with that is that I, I really am sensitive to the fact that we're replicating certain inequities there. Uh, right? He already has a point of view in his head about a maker profile, a maker portfolio rather, mm -hmm. and he's going to build one and deliver mm -hmm. one. Um, but all of that is, like I said, it's secondary. It's because I know the score, his mom knows the score, his school understands how these things work. Um, that transcript that his school sends, what we are told is that schools will spend about 60 seconds reading it. There just isn't much information on it. It's on us and his school to supply the real stuff that's going to really make the difference in his application. And that seems unjust. Uh, it feels like we should have a system in which everybody has the same tools and resources to display all of their rich experiences, not just because they come from particular experiences that are signaled as being valuable, but because they can demonstrate, um, no matter what it is they're doing, whether it's work experiences or things outside athletics, things outside the uh, traditional classroom, all become an organic part of the profile that's being sent to, uh, from their school. And do you mind if I add a couple things? Um, so, so I think that that is a that's a great specific example. I mean, I think um, you know, I, I, Christine, I, we as an organization yeah, course, could yeah. not yeah. could not agree more yeah. with what with what you're saying. Um, you know, we we are an organization that started as a as a network of independent schools, and that was partly because the founder was an independent school um, head, and he that's the folks that he knew, and partly because there was an active you know sort of let's use our power for good here. We know that the independent schools are going to get the attention of colleges, so great, let's let's use that to to start the conversation. Um, but there's a very active um, uh, drive towards equity in everything that we do. And in fact, we're in the midst of a, a you know, sort of strategic planning conversation with, with the board right now and have gotten firm commitment from them that that needs to be an integral part of what we're doing. So you know, just to give you an, an early sense here, um, so uh, we have been working hard to make sure that our services and our models uh, uh, will work for public schools. We're going to be opening up to public schools in the next uh, sort of two to three months. So by July 1st would be our commitment there. And you know, we have folks ready to go that are that are anxious to be um, in the conversation. And we will be actively reaching out to make sure that we're we're finding a full um, full range of schools. We're thinking about membership models to ensure that schools who have uh, high purple rates are incented to make sure that they're also part of the membership. Uh, we are thinking hard about <coughs> the types of services and where we are partnering with organizations, organizations like Andy's organization, organizations like others, to, to deliver some of the 
uh, early change management services and the thinking about how you make time for um, some of the shifts in, in, uh, in teacher training. Um, but, you know, so whether that's stuff that we build ourselves or whether it's stuff we do through partnership, um, you know, it's, it's deep in the design work of, of what we're trying to do. I do I, we are very nascent in this. We don't have great answers yet, but it's certainly something we're absolutely committed to. It's part of a larger project. I mean, exactly. Design from middle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And if I could just build, I mean, this, yes. is, this is like the most important part of this whole conversation mm -hmm. to me, and, mm -hmm. and partly because of the signaling effect um, that mm -hmm. this will have. Mm -hmm. Because right now, even though you know we could walk into almost any room of adults anywhere in the country and say, in a minute, you know, let's put up here all the all the competencies that today's second graders will need, and and, mm -hmm. they'll, and they'll get it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's still holding in their uh, in their head at the same time this idea of what school is and mm -hmm. what it looks like and how it operates. Right. Right. And so, the transcript as it is right now honors people who are good at school that yeah. that mm -hmm. form yeah. of school. And so it's like an altar. It's like it enshrines it, <laughs> yeah. and 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 that's what helps create this divide when people like your kid, you know, are part of an ecosystem that provides everything else in the surround that allows him to create the kind of application that he can create. So if the shrine changes, you know, that's the biggest narrative change that we could make to how people. Um, uh, attack those two colliding ideas in their head, right? Mm -hmm. That's that. It's that shrine of what school is that we need to take down. And I think what I, I, the question I have for all of you then is, this is going to require not just we talked about parents, we talked about colleges. This is going to require a, a lot to bring teachers and counselors along mm -hmm. as well. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, sort of, what work you're, you're planning to do um, with those folks, with educators, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who have to really think about how they are how they're defining success in the classroom, how they're measuring success in the classroom, and then how they're reporting out that success. Sure. Do you want to start, or? You go ahead. OK. <laughs> um, so um, you know, I, we have, I have had the pleasure of listening to a number of our member schools talk about sort of where they are in the process uh, recently. And I think one of my favorite quotes was, um, was a gentleman out of Connecticut who's like, yeah, everything's going great on the communication front, except for the students, parent, parents, <laughs> faculty, and board. So, I mean, the reality of, we all know this is a great idea, but boy, do you have to sort of work hard to pull everybody along, I think is, I, I think is deep. Um, in terms of, the, um, in terms of, of the, the work that we're doing, so um, the stuff that we've already started is we have been holding a series of site director meetings. And so we've asked each of the member schools to designate a lead for their school. And so typically this is not the head of school or the principal, but it's somebody who is in some sort of leadership, capaci leadership capacity in the school that is the designated person that's going to lead the school through their process of moving from whatever their goals are, what are their aims are for the ed uh, for their education into what that would look like with a competency model. How are they, as an organization, going to um, really start this process? Are they going to choose one of those sort of entree points that I talked about? Are they going to try to sort of go full scale because they feel like they've got the sort of progressive mandate to do it? Are they going to do a school within a school and let parents choose? Um, so th those site directors, as, as they embark on this process, uh, we, we get them together into these site director meetings. We just had one um, last week in the, in the DC area. Uh, pulled together, so last week it was a set of about 60 folks representing, I think, about 30 schools or so, um, where uh, we take them through a two-day workshop of actually thinking about all of those efforts and thinking about where the change process starts and how you pull along each of the groups, but certainly the teachers. So how do you find the folks who are change agents and, and are going to go with you no matter what and sort of put them into a group, but then how do you find the folks who are the skeptics and have the real conversation with them so that you don't end up with your skeptics and your traditionalists over here and your change agents over here and Nary the Two Shall Meet, now you've got factions in your school, but that you're actually thinking hard about that change process and the conversations that you're having to pull them along. So that's one example. Again, you know, we're about a year old, so all of this is, uh, we will be building on all of these skills, but we're looking for ways in those site director meetings to guide them through a process, establish some community so they have other site directors that they can pick up and pick up the phone and say, hey, I know you're approaching this the same way I am. This is the conversation I had last week. What the heck do I do with it? Um, and that they have some community to really build on. Mike, you were going to jump in, I think. Yeah, well, I think um, 
Uh, I saw Ted Dintersmith talk yesterday uh, mm -hmm. about his new book, um, What School Could Be. And I think one of the points that he made really articulately is that um, for us to really drive change in schools, we have to restore a lot more autonomy back into teachers and faculty, uh, the folks who really understand the work of the classroom. And so I think one of the things that is sort of central to our model of change is that this does not work as a top-down initiative. Right? You cannot go, even if you're the most inspired and compelling school leader, you cannot go and sort of top-down force a set of comp competencies into and through your school. Uh, they have to come up from the people who are doing the work. And so I think our role is really as a facilitator to arm the folks who are site directors with tools and resources and templates, uh, and also lots of examples. Uh, there is a built-in sort of a commitment to sharing in our model. Uh, so if you just get very tactical about it, um, we expect that there will be schools who will create uh, competencies that are very specific to their mission and curriculum. It has something maybe you know very unique to what they do and the, the, sort of their voice. Uh, so I'll give you an example. We have a wilderness school in Boulder, Colorado, mm -hmm. and they have some competencies that are actually about physical readiness and the ability to survive in the wild. Uh, that's pretty distinctive. Um, and if they decide that they want to go and build a set of credits around those, <coughs> we can help them uh, turn those actually into formal badges using some of the open badge framework so that they're literally shareable across platforms. Um, not every credit should be a badge, not every credit will be, um, but eventually we can create libraries where schools who have those distinct points of view, something to share, um, we can, you know, other schools will be able to borrow those and use those, and then eventually those will cascade out even beyond schools, um, so that, you know, summer camps and other programs that have similar points on that wilderness example I'm using, uh, would be able to use those as well. And so ultimately the, the realm of uh, experiences that students have where they can start to uh, measure and capture their work and learning through a framework like this gets richer and richer over time because we're sort of cross-pollinating constantly. If I can make one, so that's great, thank you. The one other comment I would make and that I should have made earlier is, I mean, you know, this is, we are new to our membership organization, but this is not new work. So there are a lot of organizations like Annie's organizations, like others who have, who have been doing this and have figured out what that teacher conversation should look like. So our other hope is that, you know, through the partnership with, um, with uh, organizations like Andy's and others, that, that we can find the right set of partners to actually talk us yeah. through that. So, it, yeah, and actually I wanted to ask Andy, I mean, we want, I mean, eventually we want to move the needle beyond individual schools and districts, because a lot of this is, you know, one-off schools and districts that are doing this work. Um, Andy, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the networks that exist. We have a lot of educators in the room. Um, some of the networks that exist that they can tap into to sort of support these ideas and grow these ideas. Yeah, um, and happily we have a couple of those networks represented right right here. So NGLC's grantee pool is, is mostly um, schools, schools that are either part of charter organizations or districts that have made this big leap or were started with this whole new set of ideas about the, the new goal line and the new set of strategies and so on. There are other networks like Digital Promise, um, represented by Kim Lee right down here, um, that have that are district membership networks. There are like 100 and 193. No, 93. Oh, 93. 93 here, and another one, um, Ed Leader 21, now part of Battelle for Kids. Um, they've got another 150 to 200 or so. You know, so there's there's like the the makings of a tipping point happening here. And collectively, all of these um, networks of forward-looking practitioners represent you know, some reasonable percentage of the student population out there. Um, so they're, they're ready to go. They're interested in all this. And they're going to love everything that they're hearing about the design of the transcript and the amount of enabling and choice and, and sort of customization it, it allows. Um, you know, the, the big challenge, and I'm thinking of conversations we've had here, is that, you know, this is one of those bizarre moments when places like Harvard and Princeton and Yale might be relative pushovers here, <laughs> but some of the state systems, there's that word systems again, right. you know, um, are not going to be as agile as that. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to take um, some real centrifugal force um, within those states to help convert those systems. And it's not that they have to say goodbye here and, and we're, we're gonna go here. There's a, probably a period of intense opting in that's gonna happen here. I mean, even among our schools and our grantees who are in the room, I'm guessing they will probably want to be able to say, 
If you're nervous about those parents, don't worry. We'll stick with the one we got. But if you would like to have your kid um, be represented in this newer, richer, deeper way, or potentially if you're a real glutton, both of them, um, <laughs> you know, do that. And we'll see how long a period that is. I don't think, it, honestly, it's gonna be very long. This feels like a big, fat, juicy, low-hanging piece of fruit on the but, tree. Well, I think, <laughs> so. <laughs> but the, yeah. the reason, yeah. I, th I think the reason that like uh, schools like Harvard, Princeton, and Yale can be agile is again because of resources. We can be, we can be agile because we can spend time reading each individual student's application, right? Yeah, right? And I mean, this goes back to the question of resources, right? The reason that um, state schools can't spend that much time on each individual application is because they have to make do with the amount of admissions officers that they have, right? And because they're held, stands, held hostage to certain state standards that are developed out of their control. Um, and so I really think, you know, I mean, when you're talking about getting teachers on, on board, there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of teachers here who would love to be on board, but again, questions of like, how do you have the time and resources to be doing it? Alternative assessment takes a lot more time, right? Um, when you think about the kinds of assessment, I worked in the writing program at Princeton <coughs> for years, we do, we, we give grades, but we also, with every single essay, we give two, typed pages of feedback. We have two individual hour meetings with every student for every essay they turn in. We have 24 students each, that's it, um, to teach two, you know, we take two classes, 12 students each in order to be able to do that. That takes a lot of resource yeah. investment, right, in, in the teacher and professional development and in terms of just money, right? Um, and so when we're thinking about, about this project, it really has to be one that comes with again, a, a kind of radical look at what we think about public education and how we're investing in our public high schools and in our public colleges, right? Yep. One other perspective I would want to share too is that um, a lot of the innovation that is happening here around things like open badges and extended transcripts is actually being driven by discussions at the community college level and state college level, uh, and it's being done in tandem with workforce. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, the challenges these folks are facing, what's giving them a real sense of urgency uh, is a sense, and you, you, we all know the numbers, uh, increasing amounts of student debt, uh, increasing amount of unfilled jobs due to skill gaps, uh, and a sense that too many graduates are underemployed or unemployed because they simply are graduating without the right skills. Um, so there is a tremendous tailwind um, that is helping all of us because of the discussions that that is driving around helping um, those schools signal very clearly what actual skills, what job skills, what 21st century skills their graduates have. And all of the discussions they're having right now um, dovetail very, very nicely with the, uh, with the kind of discussions we're having. Uh, the, the change will have to happen in terms of uh, what you said before, that alter of what skills are predictive of someone's success in college, you know, their ability to produce academic deliverables in the traditional sense, and how predictive those are or aren't for greater success in life. And I think we have to be careful about having some students, um, the goal be skill development for certain um, vocations mm -hmm. in the workforce, right? And then other students, the kind of skills be soft Holistic, skills yeah. around, right? Um, so we really have to be careful, I think, when we're having these conversations around badging and those kinds of things that we're not creating two separate systems whereby one set of students are going to highly elite liberal arts institutions to become managers and everybody else is going to be a worker in a gig economy. Yeah. You know, we, we were joking a little bit earlier about um, Yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, but I think that I think that point is a hugely important one, and I think uh, and I think this is one of those places where one of these true student benefits uh, we need to be watchful about. So when I when I think about um, the different paths that, that we're trying to make available to students and how we are trying to say, look, let, let's actually meet every student where they are and value the fact that students have very different profiles and we should. We that, there is a level of valuing of the individual in that that I think is um, true and exactly what it should be. Uh, but that also comes with students, especially those students who we have you know, most put into the system where we told them to continue to check boxes, we're going to need a lot of guidance to actually understand that, take that on, make sure they're navigating all those individual challenges in a real way. And so I think you know, that's one of those sort of maybe level, level two challenges, but um, I think we need to be really, in, in terms of building some equity and starting that from the beginning, we're gonna need to be really aware that as we create these individual opportunities, we create a very big need to make sure that we're 
guide these students effectively so that they can take advantage of them and aren't just sort of passing themselves up mm -hmm. to opportunities they, that aren't distracting from what they should have done. Yeah. So we have about three and a half minutes, and I wanted to maybe let a couple people, I know people probably have a lot of questions, but maybe let a couple people ask, and then you can come up afterwards. So I, I guess, um, and I would really defer to Andy, but I think what I'm hearing in that question is, um, w what does an implementation of this look like when it's done really in its best and most holistic? And, yeah, and, and, and yeah. I'm one of the best school districts in the country. Yeah, mm. and, what I'm, and what I think I'm hearing you describe is a version of this where it's really traditional classroom pedagogy, but it's got a different scale applied <laughs> to it, uh, and we're still using numbers, uh, and we're still using traditional tests and quizzes. Uh, and I think one of the things that makes an event like this exciting for someone like me, who frankly is coming at it from a platform perspective, not curricular, is just the amount of discussions about different ways of running school. Uh, and so I feel you because I have students, you know, kids who have had similar experiences. This is not a small lift. Um, So we are actually at time. Um, I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> um, feel free to come up and talk to them if you have additional questions. Thank you for coming.